So watching the breakfast on plus tv africa and now time to dive into uh the details uh, the headlines from the nation's national daily some very interesting and juicy stories on offer today i'd like to at this point welcome our guest analyst he's a legal practitioner tunde kola wale good morning to you mr kola wale thanks for joining us good morning thanks for having me all right. And let's um, let's get straight to uh, the first paper. We're starting with a punch, a newspaper, and some interesting headlines there. Um, the lead story: Marketers Labour warn as FG pushes refineries repairs to Buhari's successor. Um, quite a surprise on page two. The following writers: No subsidy removal until refineries are working under next government. Silver without repairing refineries. Fuel price hike imminent, says marketers' fault policies. At the top of the front page of the Punch newspaper, 6.6 .6 million Nigerians become MTN shareholders. Telco rakes in 111.75 billion naira. Details on page 19. Buhari mandates Gambari Ngige Adamu to resolve ASU crisis begs lecturers we're still there we have not moved um details on page nine wicked dodges questions on presidential ambition says window still open page 12. um for those who know the man i've studied him for about seven years <laughs> don't take too much from what he's saying right now um all revenue plunges as nigeria misses january opec quarter that's uh, quite unfortunate still with a punch newspaper Convicted Mena's 2.7 billion naira fraud, uh, fraud approved by Oronsaye, says EFCC. So Oronsaye's name uh, pump it, pop, uh, popping up again as far as corruption in Nigeria is concerned. 22,000 mother to child HIV transmissions recorded yearly. NACA, that's the National Agency for the Control of AIDS. At the bottom of that front page, Prof awarded SAN at 90 dies at UCH at 91. May so rest in peace. Kaduna lists 1,192 killed in 2021. Erufai insists terrorists must die. Obasanjo fumes over fire in Benue farm. Otom orders probe. Obasanjo fumes over fire in Benue farm. Otom orders probe. Reps recommend 390 million Naira compensation for customs killings in Oyo Katsina. There we go again. Kidnap epidemic. Gunmen abduct XLG chair for others in Ekiti. And U.S. resumes no interview process for Nigerians seeking visa renewal. Those are headlines on the front page of The Punch. All right, let's move away from the punch newspaper this morning and take a quick look at the Daily Independent. The banner caption says, Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2022 resists pressure, give assent. PDP Nas Kakos tells Buhari and Axe Party to avoid imposition of candidate in 2023. Slams APC for allegedly failing Nigerians. These are riders underneath the bold caption. Away from that, you also have bandits killed 1,192 and kidnapped 3,348 in Kaduna in 2021. This is according to the government. 2023 presidential elections, Atiko in, Mina, in Mina meets Ibrahim Babangida Badamasi. Uh, thugs vandalize Atiku campaign office and bond PDP secretariat in Gombe. Uh, these are also some of the headlines you find this morning. PDP elders ask Emmanuel not to plunge party into crisis. Are um, you led National Working Committee to meet governors? Only antiviral drugs will end COVID-19, not vaccines. Uh, this is according to the WHO. Uh, don't you find this very interesting and intriguing? So we probably might just be moving away from the issue of vaccines and getting to antiviral drugs. And uh, we will honor agreement with ASU. Buhari assures Axe Union to be uh, consistent of federal government physical pressure. Completion of Lekki Port final solution to a Papa Gridlog. This is what the governor's quoted to say, Son Rolu, 
Uh, that's what you find there. But this is some of the stories we're able to take this morning on the Daily Independent newspaper. Let's go over to the nation this morning, the lead headline there. Wiki North can't stop South from getting PDP ticket. Wiki North can't stop South from getting PDP ticket. And writer Clark Buhari's successor should come from South. And uh, yesterday we saw some story about um, Wiki and uh, a couple of other governors in the PDP from the South um, going against Atiku and uh, I think it was Tambua over this presidency issue. Um, would ask, I guess, what I'd have to plunge the party into a sort of internal crisis. Still with the Nation newspaper, uh, U.S. begins no visa interview for re renewal for Nigerians. That is, U.S. begins no interview visa renewal in Nigeria. Sorry about that. Uh, how to end banditry killings by El Rufai. How to end banditry killings by El Rufai. Uh, 1,192 killed, 3,348 kidnapped in Kaduna last year. Insurgents killed three soldiers, eight others in Niger. Forex turnover at official window dropped from $4.44 billion to $2.18 billion. Naira appreciates 415 to the dollar at the official market. At the top of that front page, dismissal of suit clears way for Balogun as Olu Badon. 50,000 barrels of crude lost to oil thieves daily. Ilumelu, $4 billion wasted. And an MTN Nigeria's offer oversubscribed by 38 billion naira. And gunmen kidnapped 10 farmers in Ondo, 5 in Ekiti. Um, at the bottom of that front page, uh, or Tom, or Tom orders probing to Obasanjo farm fire and attempted coup in Guinea-Bissau. Those are stories coming on the front page of the nation. All right, let's also look at the Nigerian Tribune this morning. And uh, the page on the Nigerian Tribune board caption says, Clark to Atiko and Saraki Tambowal, don't run. North has ruled for 45 out of... Uh, Nigeria's 61 years of independence. I mean, this is actually the premise that this is put out. He says, I will make my intention known soon. Uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubaka is quoted on that. You have uh, all of that on the Nigerian Tribune this morning as a bold caption. Uh, we, you also have cool, fe cool fever spreads to Guinea Bissau as gunfire erupts near presidential palace. Reps asks Customs to pay 390 million naira compensation to victims in Oyo and Katsina State. Banditry, 1,192 people killed in Kaduna in 2021. This is gone into report. Insurgency, Boronu government declares 100,000 persons missing. Gunmen abduct farmer owner and uh, workers in Ondo. I will honor agreement with ASU. This is according to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari. And ritual killings, Ifa doesn't support use of human parts for wealth. Traditional worship is quoted on that particular one. Let's just quickly take one or two headlines before we move away. Amber Day breaks silence and seeks active youth participation in politics. And uh, that's it this morning on the Nigerian Tribune. Well, let's just head straight to having Tunde Kola Wale share his thoughts this morning on uh, some of the big stories. It's good to have you join us, Tunde Kolawale. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so w which of the headlines interest you? Let's put it out that way. Yeah, honestly speaking, when you look at all the stories that are on the front page, the back pages, and even in spite of all the papers that you have read today, you will agree with me that what we have here are stories of tears, blood, and gnashing of teeth all over the country. There's hardly any story that is sharing. There's hardly any story that can make you happy. There's hardly any story in all those papers that uh, gives us a glimpse or a ray of hope that uh, we're about to see the, the end of the tax tunnel and then uh, march into a new Nigeria. But with that as it may, the story with regard to ritual killing uh, kind of um, uh, agitates my mind. Why do I say this? A few days ago, a 15-year-old boy, a 15-year-old boy, 
and the 17-year-old boy were arrested by the police. They were seen to have lured a teenager like themselves somewhere, decapitated the head, and they were going to use it for ritual um, uh, money-making purposes. So all over the country, where you can go today, if either our children are engaged in ritual killing for making money purposes, or they are engaged in uh, Yahoo Yahoo, or they are engaged in armed robbery, or they are engaged in banditry, and all manners of criminality. And this speaks volume for us as our people, because we say the children and, our, and the youth are supposed to be the future of the country. So if we are producing this kind of killing, at this stage in our life, in our country's history, what is going to be our hope, what is going to be our future as a nation? And in a way, you wouldn't blame those children too much. It is a, it is a foundation that we have laid as our people. Check all our allies in Nigeria. You actually can trace the origins of their wealth. And those ones that you can trace the origins of their wealth, the wealth is likely or will most likely be coming from collecting levies, charges, and royalties, and rent from ordinary poor Nigerian people, and then from the oil sector. Such that no Nigerian allies want to work again, all they want to do is to collect rent, and then levies and charges to make a good living. And the children are watching all of this. Those who are not engaged in all that, they go into politics and the public sector and then begin to steal money. A few days ago, the newly elected governor, uh, Sonjibo, said most of the people that we will find in politics today are drug barons and ritual killers and cultists and all that. If the elders are behaving in such a manner, you will not expect the children to behave in a different manner. So we really need something decisive in this area to let the children know that there is no ritual killing or ritual or whatever that we can do that will make you as rich as a as a Aliko that will make you as rich as um, a Rabiu, the Boerman, or um, Bill Gates. So the mission is at a crossroads. Parents have also failed in their responsibility in the upbringing of these children. Most times we don't ask our children where they go to whatever shoe, whatever clothes, or whatever phone that they are using. In fact, children now, and the parents now buy laptop for their children and ask them to go and learn how to do Yahoo Yahoo. There was a time that mothers from Yahoo Yahoo Mothers Association and approach the chairman of the system to release their children that they were doing in the legitimate system. So all this is saddens my heart. I feel the first when I hear these stories of ritual killing. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kololi, let, let's look at the uh, headline from the Punch newspaper. Um, of course, the Minister of, Le of, uh, of State for, for Petroleum Resources, Timmy Presova, was on TV, and he talked about the fact that um, uh, the the successor to President Buhari will have to complete the 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 repairs of the nation's refineries. Um, Nigeria has four refineries, and we're hearing that labor and um, the marketers are warning that this will push the price of uh, of uh, uh, you know PMS up. You know, especially with the expected um, removal of 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 the fuel subsidy. So the, the minister of, of state for petroleum was basically saying it it, it it's down to the next government after Buhari to complete. Um, the 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 refineries so that we can have them producing at, at maximum level. And w what what's your take on the fears expressed by labor, expressed by marketers of the impending increase because the government is saying they can complete the refineries, re re uh, repair uh, and renovation on, on time before they leave? When I support the position of labor, in fact, I was already preparing for the demonstrations and protests that Labour said they were going to embark upon with regards to the increases in the fuel uh, prices on which it was called up. You hardly can fault the position of Labour with regards to the position that they have taken in the petroleum uh, sector, the petroleum industry. Our petroleum sector has become a very, very huge scam in which the airlines, like I said, nearly take rent without adding value or improving 
whatever they have met in that area. It is sad that as an oil producing country, we have to pay this much for fuel, whether petrol or diesel or whatever. That doesn't happen in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't happen in Qatar and most of these oil producing countries of the world. And like I said, too, petroleum refining is not rocket science. They've been doing it for more than 100 years. So it shouldn't be a thing that should be difficult for us to do. There are also refineries that are 100 years old, several years older than our own, that are still running smoothly. So why would we not be able to run our own that is less than 50, 30 years old? It beats my imagination. The truth of the matter is that um, when Nigeria and Eli are preparing for election, when Nigeria and Eli have some jamboree programs to embark upon and all that, it is the oil sector that they go and dip their dirty hands to finance most of these projects. Imagine the contract that has been awarded by the present regime. You are leaving in 2023 and you are awarded contract for turn around maintenance of the refinery to be completed in six years' time. Why don't you leave that contract to the incoming government? For me, something is fishy in that area. Okay. And I've also sp spoken with engineers who have worked in those refineries, who have worked in the oil sector. And they told me that you don't require more than six months to do the turnaround maintenance of uh, all our refineries. They are, they are not too big or too, uh, they are not even the size of most of the refineries you, you find in some other places that they complete the turnaround maintenance in, in three months. Imagine if that water refinery comes on stream and then the, the, the plant has a problem. Will then what they have to wait for six years to do the maintenance and the turnaround? That will not happen because it's a business, but he knows the implications. A refinery is maintained on a daily basis. He doesn't have to break down totally before you say you have to do the turnaround. But you see, when the allies want to rent and then they want to enrich their political party, their families and all that, that is when you see them award the contract for maintenance of those refineries. Okay. More importantly, uh, too, yes. from what we have seen over the years now, it has become apparent that government has no business running any of these refineries again. They will never run it well. So we probably would have to encourage more of a liquid than hotel to establish refineries because the more you have, according to the laws of economics, the cheaper it probably will become. Okay, because it is market forces that will determine yeah, Mr. what you get in that area. Yes, please, so, sorry to interrupt you, but um, um, are we not being getting ahead of ourselves? And is, is labor and, uh, you know, the marketers who themselves are also part of labor because they, they go on strike once in a while. Um, are we not, not, not going too far and probably blowing hot air, um, you know, the, the issues and concerns raised by labor over the increase in the price, price of, of the, um, you know, fuel um, when the subsidy is removed, because the federal government has pushed the removal of subsidy to the next government, or they're saying they won't remove the subsidy until this rehabilitation is completed. And we, we've seen that it's the, the, the contracts were awarded to Technimont SPA in March 2021 last year. And it was made clear when these contracts were awarded and approved, rather, by the Federal Executive Council that the, the rehabilitation, as um, Timmy Presilva calls it, was going to take three phases. He said 18 months. 24 months and 44 months. Um, and, and so this was expected. There's nothing we can do about it, better late than never. And he's also said before now, last year, that the, the renovation or rehabilitation would see, for instance, the two refineries in Port Harcourt producing at 60% capacity. You know, so, so we'll see production coming in at the end by September, if you, if you calculate 18 months from, from March last year, you know, September, October, at least by the end of 2022, we should see the Port Harcourt refinery producing at 60% um, at, at capacity. So are we, are we, shouldn't we be optimistic rather? You know, and the ones in Kaduna and um, uh, are worried, probably taking a slower time because it started later than the rehabilitation in Port Harcourt. Shouldn't we be more optimistic, you know, instead of, of the pessimism? I am not optimistic at all. Taking the antecedents of the Nigerian life into consideration and our issue as a people, go and check your records. There has never been any government 
that we have had since 1999. That is the response to this rule that has not done one turn around maintenance of the other on all those refineries. And at the end of the turning around, have we gotten any value for our money? Are those refineries producing more or better for our optimum capacity? The answer is lies. You know, they're just looking for money to finance the next election. That's why they have awarded that Jumbo contract. With regard to subsidies, like I've always said, this may sound very unpopular, but it's a position I have arrived at. If they say they want to remove the subsidies, let them remove it. Subsidy issue has always been the lie that the Nigerian airlines have been telling us for their inability to run the country efficiently, smoothly, and diligently. So if they remove this so-called phantom subsidy and all that, let's now see what other kind of lies they will be telling for being unable to deliver the dividend of democracy, for being able to provide infrastructure, for being able to make our schools the way those schools should be, for being able to provide the good health facilities and all that. Is it not a piece of irony that the government went campaigning in 2015 and then the previous one that said there is no subsidy on petroleum products to so now come and start uh, uh, saying they will remove subsidies? Is it not ironical that a government has said we have no business increasing the pump price of a petroleum product that has now increased the pump price of petroleum product about two, three times? within the last seven years that they have been in power. So I don't buy into the argument. I, I still maintain my position that I support whatever uh, steps Labour take with regards to this. They know that the airlines are merely trying to pull rules over the eyes of the Nigerian people. Okay, so um, let's also look at another issue on the Nigerian Tribune where the leader of the Southern and Middle Belt uh, Forum, uh, Leaders Forum, Chief Edwin Clark, has advised former uh, Vice President Alaji Atiku Abubakar, former President of Senate, uh, two-time Governor of Chorus State as well, Dr. Bukala Saraki, and uh, Aminu Tambuwal not to run. Now, this is in the premise that he said that out of the 61 years of the rulership of governance in Nigeria, I mean, of Nigeria being an entity, 45 years or thereabout, you have the North actually ruling. And he's saying that, uh, you know, naturally, nobody from the North should consider uh, declaring their intention of wanting to contest for president. Well, uh, the story sent to me by Funke, I have read it. And when I read the Chief Edwin Clark's position, I chuckled to myself. Why did I chuckle? That uh, position seems to be like swimming against the current. And when you swim against the current, you know it can be catastrophic. Because when you swim against the current, rather than later, you get tired and exhausted, and then you drown in the process. First and foremost, by the the recent laws by our constitution, every Nigerian who has up to school staff certificate is allowed or has the uh, constitutional guarantee to contest whatever election that they want to contest, the each presidency or the governor. So if anybody comes out and says certain persons should be disqualified, or should stay away from contesting the presidential election, that person will be running against the current of the constitution, which I don't think um, is, um, should be encouraged. The second one is that um, I have always said that the Yoruba, the Aousa, the Fulani, the Igbos, I've only spoken very arrogantly with regard to the presidency of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You will not believe it. I was reading on the social media not too long ago. There, there are about 530 languages in Nigeria. And out of these 530 languages, only the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Alphas, and the Fulani 
have been monopolizing the power. Does it mean that the other languages in Nigeria are not entitled to the presidency of Nigeria, are not entitled to the governors, are not entitled to local government chairman? This is a matter of arrogance. So when people start saying it is our son, it should be the son of uh, the judge, the son of uh, the institute, the son of uh, uh, people. I, I, I don't subscribe to, to that kind of a thing. In fact, what they think is speaking on the face of other Nigerian tribes who are equally entitled to the presidency of Nigeria. Furthermore, you must also realize that a nation that seeks to develop must always put its best foot forward. It, it, it shouldn't matter which tribe anybody comes from. Whoever has the capacity, the diligence, the temperament, the educational qualification, and the exposure to run Nigeria diligently to the satisfaction of all the citizens who will be able to deliver the different of democracy, provide infrastructure, upgrade all our rundown schools and hospitals, should be the one that we should encourage to become the president of Nigeria. After all, when you look at it critically, when most of these uh, tribal and religious dissenters get to power, they don't serve the people of their region. They first serve themselves, they serve their family, and then they begin to serve their friends, and then the people in their respective political uh, uh, parties. What difference does Obasanjo John make in the life of the Yoruba people? What difference does the good Lord Jonathan make in the life of uh, the Ijo people? What, is, what difference is Bari making in the life of uh, the Alta Fulani people? The northern part of the country has been turned to a battlefield, I mean, into a war zone, and bloodletting and banditry on a daily basis. For me, let's put our best foot forward. I am not saying uh, um, that there um, are no qualified people. Tunde Kola Wale. For some of these minority tribes. Tunde Kola Wale. Uh, let's also look at it from this angle now. Um, the issue of the issue that um, Edwin Clark has actually raised uh, in a subtle way is the issue of zoning. And uh, the zoning, as we already know in the Nigerian polity, as a lot of people would describe it, has been a gentleman agreement that does not have its place in the constitution. However, this is what it is. 45 out of 61 years, uh, you have the dominance of a certain region. Uh, are you saying that you're not in support of, you know, the zoning system or the politics of zoning that's been going on? The, uh, the zoning system is a gentleman's agreement. It is not bad public the constitution or the electoral act. So if any citizen decides not to abide by the zoning arrangements and all that, there is nothing that you can do about that. Absolutely nothing. Because zoning is a gentleman agreement. But, but the, 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 the phrase here, yeah. uh, I'm sorry to interject. I, I'm sorry to, to, to interject. The issue of agreement is very strong. Agreement is some kind of you know, negotiation that two, two or more persons come into. They agree. It's called agreement. Yeah. And so over time, if you have um, every other person playing by the rule and, uh, you know, um, playing to this uh, agreement and playing to the gallery, what happens when it becomes the turn of another person? Do you think it's well, fair? Let's look at morality now in this case. Of course, morality is not law. Well, it might not be fair, but it's important that we have a global perspective of the direction which we want to take Nigeria to as a nation. And uh, when you are talking about an agreement, we have in law what we call honor agreement, which is to say it is not binding. It is mere custom. It's mere a gentleman agreement between two people. If we institutionalize this is only thing, the dangers are that uh, we might not be putting our best foot forward as a nation. We might not be having the best hand to run our country as a people. And where the best of the hand is not running your country as a people, it will be difficult to break through and develop. But like I said, I know that there is no part of this country that you go to that you won't find capable hands. But 
So let us uh, elevate this zone and the uh, regional or tribal thing to a constitutional level in which when good answers come on board or throw their ass into the ring, then we will shut them out because there is a zone in uh, arrangement. And then with people like Edwin Clark too, <laughs> he was one of the closest advisors of Dr. Gulag Jonathan when he was there. If Dr. Gulag Jonathan got me having done well, and like most people who want to say or see, then uh, what is the quality of uh, advice that you get from people like Edwin Clark? Uh, these are inspired, tired um, uh, old men who don't have a fan and who don't have uh, a long view of history. They, they, they are not uh, digital, so to say. So I will still prefer that we talk about the best of our hands, the most educated, it is primitive okay. in the 21st century okay. to say that uh, you will be doing rotation and then you will be doing right. tribal and regional politics. Mr. Kolawale, th thank it you. It doesn't move the Yes, we, we, have to, we have to move on, but I, I'm, I'm sure Edwin Clark would, would have a response to you <laughs> if he hears he, he, you know, he, he, he described as a tired old man. Um, maybe you say he's just simply um, you know, uh, defending the, uh, the fairness you know, in, in terms of the regionalism and the ethnopolitics of Nigeria. But let, let, let's move on to um, uh, the, pre the front page of the Punch newspaper. Um, it's, if they've told us about President Buhari's uh, statement where he's mandated Gambari, Ingigi, and Adamo to resolve um, the ASU crisis begs lecture. That's what the headline say, says. Uh, Buhari mandates Gambari, Ingigi, Adamo to resolve ASU crisis begs lecturer. lecturers. Um, th this statement was made when the uh, Nigerian Interreligious Council, led by, headed by the Sultan of Sokoto and the, uh, uh, the president of the Christian Association of Nigeria, paid him a courtesy call at Asso Rock. And the Nigerian Interreligious Council has been uh, uh, dialoguing with the lecturers. That's one of the work that they're doing to see how they can also resolve uh, or have an influence in resolving the issue. So those are one of the things they laid on the table when they visited the president. And he said that... Um, the, the NIREC should tell the lecturers that, you know, the, the president or the federal government holds them in very high regard. You know, that's what he says. So what are your thoughts on this? It's uh, shocking to me that Mr. President will be making that kind of a statement. I don't know how long you have been to some of these Nigerian universities, colleges of education and polytechnic. I was uh, one of my children attended my alma mater, which is the University of Ibadan. And uh, initially, he was going to stay in the hostel, and the rooms in which there were two of us, when I was there, I find 11 people who are occupying those rooms. Those children were also cooking in the room. Some have electric oven, some have... Uh, uh, so some more manners of gadgets to do the cooking. When I entered the room, the room was like an old room. And uh, because of that, I don't see any meaningful study that any child can do in that kind of environment. And so the boy had to team up with two of his friends to go and rent a three-bedroom flat outside the investors at the campus to be able to live a comfortable life and then be able to face his studies. Also, when I took a tour of the zoological garden of the University of Ipatum, and also the laboratories that we have in the University of India, all of them were empty. And you can say the same for all the universities and polytechnics that we have all over the country. And that is the reason in so many parts of the world now, certificates from the federal government and state universities are no longer being recognized not just for admission, but also for work. Most employers of labor today also prefer to hire people who are coming from the private university because most of our universities no longer have the equipment, the teachers, the libraries to be able to teach these children what ordinary they should be taught. So the solution would have been for all to cut our course in some other area, like in the area of politics. Look at the amount of money we are spending on politics. 
Look at the billions that will go into the coming election. Look at the salaries of the executive arm of government, of the legislature. See how much are spending on them. So, 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 have so, a unicamera just one yeah. uh, uh, national assembly. So, so, Mr. Kolawole, I, 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 uh, yeah. so, Mr. Kolawole, at the this, and this point, level. yeah, this point you're making, sir, is uh, it, it, it kind of dovetails into what also, in a way, the president is saying. Um, he told them, you know, that uh, he appealed through NIREC to ASU to be cognizant of the fiscal pressures, the fiscal pressures that the government was currently facing. In other words, a paucity of funds. We don't have too much money, you know, to spare. So just, you know, take that into account. Um, you know, and, and, and the fact that he says, oh, the government re remains committed, you know, to, to preventing strikes, to, you know, um, um, honoring its agreement with ASU. Um, but what do you make of the fact the president is complaining about fiscal pressures and ASU should be aware of that and take cognizance of that? Um, but he's also taking a visit by this group, these spiritual leaders, for the president to put together a committee, you know, maybe sort of like a reaction. What, what's your take on, on that? The ASU people should not uh, accept to be fixed for any reason whatsoever. Because like I said, when you look at the money we are spending on politics, you and I will know there is no justification for it. When you also look at the cost of contract in this part of the world, you and I will know that it's one of the highest in the world. When you also look at the mongrel amount of money, or I mean that is being stolen from the public funds, you and I will know that there is money that is just the cost. We are refused to cop corruption, excesses in the land and put the right the technology in the right places so cost can fall. That is why we are saying we have no money to fund the education. If countries like the US, like Britain, <coughs> and what have you, are able to fund their education because the new education is the bedrock of development. <coughs> sorry, sorry. And not sorry. democracy. So I, I think it's okay if you actually take water or uh, something. Sorry about that. Just uh, take a break. Yes, yes. Int interesting uh, uh, analysis from 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 uh, from Kola uh, um, You're saying as federal government we have a paucity of funds, uh, and uh, you know we have fiscal challenges, but um, government spending is still is still up there. You know, and he's made a fantastic point. If you say there's no money or we're struggling with finances, and also should also think remember that what can you cut down. You know, what can we, how can we, you know, plug the leakages um, and the holes and, and try and reduce government spending? You know, he, he's made a fantastic point. You know, recurrent expenditure pretty high, you know, so the budget's concerned. But Mr. Kolo, are you there still? Hello? Yeah, are you with us, sir? Yes, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think we can proceed with um, uh, some more stories uh, from the papers, and I hope you're you are okay. Um, another one I'm that... A yes. Okay, thank, thank you. Another one that caught, caught our attention is one on the front page of the Daily Independent, um, where okay. it has this headline, PDP elders ask Emmanuel not to plunge the party into crisis. Iyoche Ayu led National Working Committee to meet with, meet with governor. Now, I don't know if you've seen uh, the, the, the pictures of um, the commissioner, uh, commissioner in Akwabom City, commissioner for lands. Um, uh, he's commissioner for lands and water resources. His name is uh, Umo Eno. Um, he happens to be a cleric or a pastor who is in the cabinet, kneeling down um, before Governor Dom Emmanuel. Um, it, it seems to be getting the party upset that the governor said, this is who I want to succeed me. This is my anointed candidate. I mean, is, is the governor not as an individual allowed to say, oh, I support this, this person? It is very totally wrong. It is the electorate that should decide who should succeed uh, whatever government is uh, leaving power. But you and I will remember that even Governor Emmanuel too is a beneficiary of uh, the sectoral uh, of the sectoral plan of his own predecessor. The reason why this is so is not perfect. Most people leaving power, especially governors, usually have so much skeleton in their comfort, that they cannot afford to allow just anybody 
to take over from them. So they usually shop around for minions, for yes boys, for people they can dictate to who will be able to cover up their skeleton. That is why you find the governor and the president are only shopping for their successor. But in an ideal society, in an ideal environment, that is not what should happen. Whoever is interested in any of these positions, she just throw his hat into the ring. If he wins the primary, get the flag of his party. Then he begins to contest the election. And if he wins, he loses. But I doubt it whether the present crop of leaders that we have we ever allow such things to happen in Nigeria. And that is where you find out all the parties not just in Akwaibom, almost all over the states now, are in crisis. What, look at what has become of the PDP families in the Kiti state. Look at what has happened. Are the APC families in the state? They went and doctored the whole thing, and it is the person that one party leader, one government, one a successor, that has won the families of all those uh, parties. And that is carrying all the parties apart. It's a thing that we should be uh, call And I think the Nigerian uh, like, I mean, uh, the Nigerian uh, people, especially the electorate, can begin to teach these people a lesson in that area. Once we see that it is on millions that the Alton governor has chosen, not vote against them. After all, there are more than 100 political parties in Nigeria. <coughs> Who might be having flag bearer in all the government elections? Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Barrister Tunde Kolawale. We really do, really do appreciate your time uh, with us this morning, and we look forward to sharing more of your thoughts on some national issues. Thank you for having me. It's all right, and we hope Sorry that you... Sorry for my croaky voice this morning. No, that's okay. We think that you should take mm -hmm. a, cu a cup of warm water. Uh, that will probably Thank just you. Do. I will. I will. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the much we Thank can you. actually Thank you. Have a lovely day. You too. Thank I've you so much. I've been watching all the beautiful jobs that people have been doing. Thank you so much. We do appreciate you as well. You. Well, that's the much yeah. we can take on the papers this morning. Very intense. Uh, we will morning. definitely come back with the paper review tomorrow. But in the meantime, let's tell you what happened today in the history. And when we come, we will head straight to our major, first major conversation. We'll be looking at the militarization in the region, of course, Africa and West Africa as a whole.